Since the days of ancient Egypt, the people of every civilization have had their own written languages, their own historical documents. Yet today, much of what we know about these past civilizations, we've learned by studying the buildings they left behind. Even in our own time, in our own community, the study of buildings can be useful. It gives us perspective beyond the printed word and photograph, perspective on our own brief past, who we were, how we lived, what we believed. All this is revealed by the structures we built and how we built them. Production of If These Walls Could Speak has been made possible by funds from the Architectural Foundation of Nebraska, the Ada and Leon Millard Foundation, Peter Kiewit Sons Incorporated, First National Bank of Omaha, the Allen and Marcia Bear Family Charitable Trust, and the Robert J. Kutak Foundation, with additional support from the Junior League of Omaha, the Construction Specifications Institute, Lyman Ritchie Corporation, and the Nebraska Humanities Council. By 1859, the settlement of Council Bluffs, Iowa was a bustling pioneer town. One hot August day, a tall, thin man arrived by steamboat to look at a parcel of land he had received as collateral for a loan. He climbed a steep bluff and looked across the Missouri River toward the village of Omaha. He didn't make the ferry crossing to visit the village, but four years later, as president, he would make it a primary gateway to the West. the 1840s. America's economic and industrial centers were in the east. In the far west were mountains containing gold, silver, and other minerals. East of the Missouri lay some of the world's richest farmland. To its west was a vast sea of grass and the great American desert. Adventurers brave enough, or desperate enough, to attempt the journey across it could be outfitted in Canesville, Iowa, renamed Council Bluffs in 1854, then have their wagon and all they owned ferried across the Missouri River. Once on the Omaha shore, they were within 20 miles of the Platte River and the great Platte River Road. Location was very critical because uh, of the proximity of what became uh, the city of Omaha uh, to the Platte River Valley, which uh, since the 1840s had uh, witnessed a heavy overland migration to Oregon, Utah, and California. The route was pioneered by the Mormons on their way to Utah, and the 49ers headed to California. By the 1850s, there was a small but steady stream of people heading west along the Platte. Omaha got its start really in the minds of some very enterprising Council Bluffs businessmen who thought that they could make some money ferrying people across the river at that point if there was a settlement on the other side. They also thought then that they could market goods to people who were on their way west, would leave from Council Bluffs and would cross the river at that point. In the fall of 1853, the Council Bluffs and Nebraska Ferry Company completed surveys for a town on the west side of the Missouri. Legally, it was Indian territory, but Indian rights were of little concern to developers of the period. In 54, the Omaha Indians signed a treaty which ceded the land to the United States in return for a reservation to the north in Thurston County. 
the Kansas-Nebraska Act opened the area to white settlement. Omaha's first permanent residents were Rachel and William Uncle Billy Snowden in 1854. They arrived with three children and moved into Omaha's first building, a log cabin built by the ferry company at what would now be 12th and Jones. The Big Six store, a sod-walled grocery and saloon, soon followed. It also served as post office. Postmaster A.D. Jones delivered the mail. It fit in his hat. Early speculators soon spread word of Omaha to the east. Omaha City, Nebraska Territory promises to be a second edition Chicago. We have before us a plan of Omaha City laid out in lots, numbered 1 up to 322. Altogether, the prospects for Omaha City are good. The New York Herald. Omaha City was a handful of buildings, a name, a map, and sales hype. The map, drawn to promote property sales, showed a grid of streets that ignored the hilly terrain. On that map, Omaha's founders set aside land for a territorial capital building. Florence, Bellevue, Nebraska City, every river town knew it should be the capital. Francis Burt from South Carolina was appointed the first governor of the Nebraska Territory by President Franklin Pierce. It's believed that Burt favored Bellevue as the capital site, but he fell ill and died shortly after arriving in the territory. Secretary of the Territory Thomas Cumming, only in his mid-twenties, assumed control. He selected Omaha, where he and several friends had business interests, as the territorial capital. It was a controversial decision. The territorial capital was critical to set Omaha apart from the other river cities that were vying for supremacy in Nebraska Territory in the 1850s. By getting the designation of the territorial capital, it kept Omaha going. It had something to keep that, that settlement going until it was later selected as the site for the Union Pacific Railroad. So it was very critical to the early survival of the city. January of 1855. The first territorial legislature met in a building built by the ferry company on the west side of 9th Street between Douglas and Farnham. It was the town's first brick building and it also served as Omaha's school and church. Several crude wooden hotels were quickly constructed. The one-story city hotel was the site of the inaugural ball for newly appointed territorial governor Mark Izzard from Arkansas. Newcomers attending the ball quickly learned about Nebraska winters. The floors were scrubbed that cold February day, and they froze over, causing more than a few mishaps among dancers that evening. It wasn't much to look at, but the river town and territorial capital did attract people. Many hoped to buy land early and sell high later. Soon, lots were selling for up to $4,000. Steamboats arrived almost daily, bringing people and building supplies. I do not deem it advisable to think of moving my family to this place until buildings are more plenty. When I left St. Joseph, there were 50 families awaiting a boat for this place. When they come, I know not what they will do. There is not a vacant house in town and the hotels are full. Boats are daily expected with lumber, which will be speedily put into dwellings. Erastus Beetle. It was 1856. With the boom came Omaha's first business center, the Pioneer Block, on the north side of Farnham between 11th and 12th. Nebraska's first denominational church, St. Mary's Catholic, was built near 8th and Howard. A Protestant church followed at 16th and Farnham. Churches were really critical in a frontier settlement such as Omaha because it signified that there was some effort at what they would have said was civilization at that time. Uh, indicating that these were going to be a settled people. Uh, they weren't godless out there on the frontier, but that they were bringing all the trappings of Eastern civilization with them, including churches. By the time Omaha was incorporated in 1857, it had 2,000 residents. It was a frontier town full of saloons, gamblers, and rough characters. To help deal with claim violators and horse thieves, Douglas County constructed a much-needed courthouse and jail on the west edge of town near 16th and Farnham. A house for the sheriff stood next door so his wife could feed the prisoners. 
In 1857, Omaha and the nation were hit hard by a financial panic. Luckily, the next year, gold was discovered in Colorado, and in the rush that followed, Omaha's economy boomed. Between March and November of 59, some 270 boats arrived. There was money to be made. It cost the average settler $500 to be outfitted and travel from Omaha to Colorado. By 1860, Omaha's population had grown to more than 3,000, and nearly 1,500 buildings had been erected. One, built on the hill on the west end of town, was a territorial capital building, but other towns still claimed they should be the capital. In January 1858, when the legislature met in the new building, representatives of other towns protested vocally. Some sessions broke into fistfights. Several legislators left in protest and met in Florence. The new capital, standing upon an eminence overlooking the Missouri River, presented an imposing appearance, and its unique and magnificent proportions contrasted sharply with the primitive scattered settlements to the east of it. John Rush. Despite its grand appearance, the Capitol was built quickly and cheaply. Some of the pillars collapsed while it was still under construction. It was torn down within 12 years. The Herndon House was Omaha's finest hotel. It had few stoves and no running water. That luxury was still a few years away. The Herndon Hotel was a huge affair. Leading politicians and leading men stopped there. If the silent walls of the hotel could talk, they would tell of public men their plans, their schemes concocted in the rooms. Author William de Courcy. The wheelers and dealers who met at the Herndon House were anxious to make sure Omaha benefited from the Railroad Act passed by Congress in 1862. They planned a Union Pacific Railroad to the West. They must have figured the name would appeal to President Abraham Lincoln when he selected the Eastern Terminus. Major General Grenville Dodge was working on the Union Army's railroads and was a strong advocate for the Platte River route he had surveyed years before. During the explorations in 1856 or 57, I happened to return to Council Bluffs where Mr. Lincoln happened to be on business. After dinner, Lincoln came and sat beside me and in his kindly way and manner was soon drawing from me all I knew of the country west and the result of my surveys. The secrets that were to go to my employer, he got. Grenville Dodge. On December 2nd, 1863, Lincoln signed a proclamation fixing the terminus, but it was unclear whether it was in Omaha or Council Bluffs. With no bridge over the river, construction began in Omaha. The Union Pacific Railway uh, and its headquarters being stationed in Omaha uh, made Omaha the city that it became. All you have to do is look at the 1850s or the 1860s and look at the number of uh, small, competitive towns along the Missouri River in Nebraska, Omaha being only one of them, and then look at those same towns today. They all exist, and of course there's only one large one, and that's Omaha. Nearly two years went by before the first Union Pacific track was laid. The nation's energies were going to the Civil War. More than 3,000 Nebraskans, 10% of the territory's population, had gone to war. When hostilities ended in 1865, veterans from both armies found themselves out of work. Many joined the immigrants working on the iron highway stretching into the frontier, or settling in the little towns strung at 20-mile intervals along the road like beads on a string. From the beginning when the railroad came, it brought workers to build the railroad. It brought people who were riding the railroad to go west to settle their lands, some of whom stayed in Omaha. And it also facilitated the economy of the city of Omaha because of the raw materials that could be brought here with the railroad and could be hauled out from here. The Homestead Act of 1863 offered free land to anyone willing to live and work on it. Many homesteaders came through Omaha and shipped the products of their labor back to Omaha. In 1867, part of the Nebraska Territory became the 37th state of the Union. 
The majority of Nebraskans lived south of the Platte River, and they determined the capital should leave Omaha. A state capital was built in the town of Lancaster, renamed Lincoln. Few in Omaha lamented the loss of the capital. People were too busy unloading steamboats and working the railroad yards. Warehousers and shopkeepers worked day and night to meet the demand for supplies. There are at least 300 new buildings finished or underway already, and it's very likely another 100 will be completed before winter puts an end to outdoor work. Joseph Barker, Jr., August 1866. By 68, Omaha's population was estimated as high as 16,000. To house and support so many people, buildings were put up quickly. Comfort was at a premium. There was no water system, only individual cisterns. There was no city sewer system, few sidewalks, and no paved roads. Some towns are formed for beauty and others for deeds of blood. But say what you may of Omaha, it beats them all for mud. The first several decades of Omaha's development were not really distinguished by any real planning of how the city should grow. And so you could have housing next to uh, industrial type buildings, next to factories or anything else. Omaha was a typical frontier town. Its bars, brothels, and gambling halls earned Omaha the nickname Sodom on the Missouri. It would keep that reputation for some years. But Omaha was gradually changing. By the late 60s, brick buildings were replacing some of the hastily built wood structures. St. Philomena's Cathedral replaced the early frame church, and First Presbyterian Church was built. Their slender spires were Omaha landmarks for many years. In 1867, two major business blocks were constructed. They were the core of a retail business district developing along Douglas and Farnham west of 13th Street. In 1868, the United States government established the Sherman Army Barracks several miles north of the city on 30th Street. The intention is to winter troops here engaged in service on the plains and to make it the chief depot for the purchase, storage, and reshipment of Army supplies to the west. It will cause large continuous disbursements of money, increasing local trade, and giving increased market facilities for the productions of the state at large. Omaha Weekly Herald, 1868. Within a decade, the outpost became Fort Omaha, headquarters of a military command area which included six states and territories. By the 1880s, Fort Omaha consisted of 38 buildings, including a home built for Civil War cavalry leader, General George Crook. May 10th, 1869. Word came to Omaha and the nation via the telegraph line that a gold spike had been tapped into a hole in a polished laurel tie at Promontory, Utah, uniting the Union Pacific and Central Pacific Railroads. The event set off parades in New York, San Francisco, Omaha, and other cities. Construction continued, and when a bridge across the Missouri was completed in 72, Omaha was linked to both coasts. The Union Pacific built a much needed station in the mid 70s. Omaha was a transfer point for eight railroads truly a gateway to the West. The structurally unsafe Capitol building was raised, and in its place, an ornate Victorian high school rose. Completed in 1872, it was the most visible landmark in the city. In the late 19th century, only about 10% of high school age students actually went to high school. And a public high school then, much like the post office or the county courthouse, would be a great public statement of uh, the middle class and the prosperity of the city. It gave the town stature. Higher education followed in 1878, thanks to the Creighton family. 
Edward Creighton made a fortune hauling freight to western miners and building the central portion of the nation's telegraph line. When he died, his wife donated funds to establish a college in his memory. A building was erected at 24th and California streets to house Creighton College. Some considered it too far from town. Omaha barely reached 20th Street. By 1870, Omaha had two hospitals, Clarkson and St. Joseph, the latter another gift of the Creightons. With the railroad driving its economy, plus a high school, a college, hospitals, and churches, Omaha was clearly here to stay. The early 1870s brought drought and grasshoppers to the plains. In 1873, the entire nation was thrown into another financial panic. Omaha was insulated from the worst effects due to the vast region served by its trains headed west with dry goods and tools and returning with grain and metal ore. The grain gave rise to numerous mills, seven breweries, and Willow Springs, the largest distillery in the country. The metal ore made Omaha a major site for refining, including the nation's largest white lead works. In 1874, the federal government constructed a $300,000 post office and custom house on the southwest corner of 14th and Dodge. It was the site of the famous trial of Chief Standing Bear, which established for the first time that Native Americans were persons under the law. In 1870, the Union Pacific Railroad took over the Herndon House for its headquarters. City leaders felt Omaha needed a new first-class hotel. In 1873, they financed construction of the five-story Grand Central Hotel. Five years later, during a remodeling project, the torches used as work lights set the walls ablaze. That noblest pile of architecture in the West, which has been Omaha's pride for years, the Grand Central Hotel, is burning before our eyes, and human power seems incompetent and childish in all efforts to save it. Omaha Herald, September 5th, 1878. Five firemen died. The hotel was completely destroyed. Major fires were common in those days of wood frame buildings and open flames for lighting, heating, and cooking. When it opened in 1881, Boyd's Opera House on the northeast corner of 15th and Farnham was promoted as fireproof. Its builder was James Boyd, a two-term mayor of Omaha who would later serve as Nebraska's governor. Boyd's Opera House introduced a new level of luxury and grandeur to Omaha. Up to 1,700 patrons could attend the musical reviews, plays, lectures, variety shows, and expositions offered there. It was the place where the political debates occurred, where the singers appeared, uh, where all the important cultural activities could occur in this frontier city. And it clearly indicated that Omaha was no longer on the frontier, but a more permanent settlement that could afford to have its own opera house that uh, was a place for cultural activities. Omaha's premier symbol of culture burned down in 1892, another major landmark lost to fire. As late as 1881, most of Omaha's important buildings were still made of wood. Though Omaha's population was over 30,000, there was only a quarter of a mile of paved roads and still no water or sewer systems. Then in 10 years, Omaha was transformed from a frontier town into a city. Omaha grew very rapidly in the 1880s because of the filling in of the last west. That is, if you look at the development of the United States, the United States gradually developed west from the Atlantic coast until it got to the Missouri River, and then it jumped to the west coast following the Oregon and California Trail, so that Oregon and California came into the nation as states before the Civil War. 
So really, the last west is the area between the Missouri River and the Rocky Mountains. In the 1880s, Nebraska's population doubled to about a million people. Omaha's population tripled to over 100,000. It was a major metropolitan area, and its new buildings reflected that. A courthouse was built at 17th and Farnham. The streets were so steep they were difficult to walk up, let alone build on, so between 1883 and 87, the area around the courthouse was graded down twice. Steps were added leading to the courthouse doors. Meanwhile, homeowners near the riverfront and rail yards found their land was simply too valuable to live on. They moved out, and a bustling warehouse and wholesale district rose. From this market area, goods were shipped by rail to small towns all the way to the Pacific coast. Further west, at what had been the edge of town, prestigious homes along Farnham Street from 16th to 18th made way for business structures like the Paxton Block and a group of buildings that would dominate the skyline of Omaha. As a result of the economic growth and expansion that occurred in the 1880s, there were a number of very significant land use changes in the downtown area. One in particular was on the hill at 17th and Farnham, where Joseph Millard's home was replaced by, in fact, what had been the city's first skyscraper, the New York Life Building. The New York Life Building was designed by McKim, Mead, and White, one of the most prestigious architectural firms in the country. It stood 10 stories tall, plus a tower. Visitors packed picnic lunches and paid 10 cents admission to ride the city's first elevator to the observation deck for a panoramic view of the city. The fact that Omaha uh, has a, a major regional office for this, this corporation indicates that uh, uh, this city was not going to be overlooked by New York, that uh, the consciousness of New York that we had the, uh, the population with the financial resources to be an important player in the, uh, the game that uh, the capitalists were uh, conducting around the United States. Across the street from the New York Life, the B newspaper constructed a new office building. Next to the B, at 18th and Farnham, the cornerstone was laid for Omaha's first permanent city hall in 1890. To its sealed recesses, we confide such evidence of our city's present size and prosperity as may serve to interest the busy populace of some future generation when these firm walls shall crumble. Historians would come to examine this city hall much as they examined the Egyptian pyramids or Roman ruins. Mayor R.C. Cushing. Two years later, construction began on a massive new U.S. post office at the northwest corner of 16th and Dodge. Like the B building and the city hall, it was built in a monumental style called Romanesque. Well, this Romanesque style uh, is a kind of building of, of big shoulders, to refer to Carl Sandburg's uh, description of a city at the time, that uh, these were important buildings of uh, impressive materials, a big scale, uh, a, a presented silhouettes of a kind of uh, confidence and, uh, and boldness for the, the city streetscape. The post office occupied a full city block. It took 14 years to complete at a cost of nearly two million dollars. Construction was supervised by a 34-year-old immigrant named John Latenzer. He would become one of Omaha's most noted architects. Omaha's post office was considered a prime example of Richardsonian Romanesque architecture. By the early 90s, as one stood on 16th Street and looked down Farnham at the City Hall, the B Building, the Courthouse, and the New York Life Building, it was clear Omaha was a city. Water and sewer systems were started. Streets were graded and paved. 
sidewalks improved, phone service and electric lighting appeared, and six streetcar companies served the city. In 1891, a new Boyd's Opera House opened, this one made of brick. The Creighton Orpheum Theater followed a few years later. Omaha's first permanent public library was built at 18th and Harney. The land was donated to the city by pioneer real estate investor Byron Reed upon his death. When completed in 1894, the library was acclaimed for its simple elegance and its distinctive exterior treatment featuring busts of writers. The library was the first major commission of a young architect named Thomas Kimball. By the turn of the century, his name would be known in architectural circles throughout the nation. A new exposition building or Grand Opera House was built at 15th and Capitol, along with a Coliseum at 20th and Burdett. The first Douglas County Hospital was built west of town at 40th and Poppleton. Other hospitals, organized earlier, moved to new, more substantial buildings. The Union Pacific erected a new depot on 9th Street. Omaha set records for construction in the 1880s and early 90s that have never been equaled. Meanwhile, south of the city, another community was growing even faster, along with a new industry, meatpacking. It was logical that the marketing of the livestock would be at a place uh, in good proximity to where the cattle were produced. So Omaha had an advantage as compared to Chicago because Omaha was 500 miles closer to the cattle. And uh, this uh, cut down on weight losses uh, which occurred in the shipping of the livestock. William Paxton had made money hauling freight for the railroad. He invested it in cattle and made even more. Paxton joined with other investors in establishing the Union Stockyard Company in 1883. The company soon outgrew its farmhouse office building and built the first livestock exchange building complete with a 70-room hotel. Soon after construction was completed, they discovered it wasn't big enough and built additions on either side. It's a combination of local entrepreneurs, uh, people in the cattle industry, and, and the big packers. And what happened, uh, first the stockyards was established, and then uh, they wanted to bring in uh, big packers. And at this time, the packing industry, one of the major big industries in the United States, and they provided incentives uh, such as actually building plants and uh, giving them to uh, packers rent-free for three, five years. Chicago meat packers were lured to the town of South Omaha, and packing houses sprang up with a hunger for labor. South Omaha had grown to 1,500 residents by 1886. Three years later, the population had exploded to more than 8,000. South Omaha was nicknamed the Magic City. The boom of the 80s brought prosperity, expansion, and inflation. Then, Nebraska farmers saw some of the driest years in decades. In Omaha, things went from bad to worse. Fort Omaha was deactivated, and Omaha's business engine, the Union Pacific Railroad, was broke. At an auction held on the front steps of its Omaha freight house, the entire company was sold to a group of investors led by E.H. Harriman of New York. During the entire year, I do not recall a single instance where money was invested in the construction of new buildings. There was no apparent need of additional ones, as most of our stores were idle, 
also some 5,000 houses. Ed Moriarty, 1896. As the century drew to a close, Omaha and the nation began a slow climb from the economic slump. Civic leaders looked for a way to make a statement to the world about the promise of Omaha. They planned a great exposition for the summer and fall of 1898. It would mark the beginning of another period of growth and construction of buildings on an epic scale. By the 1880s, the United States, barely a hundred years old, began to emerge as a world power. The western territories were dividing into states. Technology changed people's lives as never before. Fortunes were made exploiting the vast natural resources of the west. In America's growing cities, government and business constructed more than buildings. They erected monuments. Buildings which spoke of permanence and grandeur. Through the 1880s and early 90s, the city of Omaha experienced explosive growth. Buildings like the city hall and post office were built in the Romanesque style, as state and city governments strove to make a statement about themselves. Then depression and drought struck. The boom of the 80s was followed by the bust of the 90s. As the country began a long, hard recovery, Promoters looked for a way to spotlight the promise of Omaha, the nation's fourth largest city west of the Missouri. The landmark World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago helped point the way. The World's Columbian Exposition of 1893 in Chicago really set the example for other communities on how to do a, a World's Fair, which is what they were at that time. Not only the idea to do it, but also the style of buildings, uh, the glitter, glittering white city, as it was known, with the classical and Renaissance style buildings, became the style that was used for uh, the exposition in Omaha in 1898. We believe that an exposition of all the products, industries, and civilization of the states west of the Mississippi River made at some central gateway where the world can behold the wonderful capabilities of these great wealth-producing states would be of great value not only to the trans-Mississippi states but to all the home seekers of the world. William Jennings Bryan. It was called the Trans-Mississippi and International Exposition. Banker and entrepreneur Gurdon Waddles convinced the federal, state, and local governments to support the exposition, along with 6,000 individual investors. As Waddles raised funds, Omaha architect Thomas Kimball and his partner Howard Walker planned the construction. They established regulations for design and styles and commissioned architects from across the country. Land north of the city stretching from 16th to 24th Street was acquired from developer Herman Kuntz. Hundreds of workers and craftsmen constructed a 2,000-foot-long lagoon surrounded by a series of elaborate white buildings, including an agricultural building, a liberal arts building, and a government building, all trimmed in newfangled electric lights. The Trans-Mississippi and International Exposition opened its gates on June 1, 1898. It was a sensation. Beyond the lagoon, other adventures awaited visitors on the Midway, 
They were lifted 200 feet in the air by a giant seesaw, rode a scenic railway, walked a street of all nations, took in a Wild West show, visited Indian encampments, and met Geronimo, or watched a model of the battleship Maine being blown up in a recreation of Havana Harbor. By the time the exposition closed in October, President McKinley and two and a half million other visitors had attended. It was obviously not a representation of real life on the plains. It was a dream city. Grand as they looked, the buildings were not meant to last. They were constructed of lath, horsehair, and plaster. They were demolished. The grounds reverted to developers. But the classical revival style of buildings seen in the grand expositions of that era influenced American architecture for years. I think in terms of the long haul situation, uh, it uh, represented a passage uh, from the frontier period uh, to the impending 20th century. It represented a passage from the recent hard times of the 1890s uh, to uh, what was anticipated would be a um, very glorious future. The exposition helped architect Thomas Rogers Kimball gain a national reputation. His father was an executive with the Union Pacific and a banker. The family's social position and wealth enabled the young Kimball to study at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and in Paris. Kimball's design of the Omaha Public Library a few years earlier had put him in demand. Even as he was planning the exposition, the Burlington Railroad commissioned Kimball to design a new station at South 10th Street. It was completed in 1898. It was the Burlington that anticipated the exposition and gave Omaha terminal accommodations compatible with its size and business enterprise. Omaha World Herald. Kimball's design for the Burlington Station was another example of a classical revival style. It resembled a Greek temple with 28 columns of pink granite at its entrance. The columns were more than decorative. They helped disperse the crowd as it came and went. By the turn of the century, efforts to rebuild the financially troubled Union Pacific resulted in a quick turnaround. A new passenger depot was erected at 10th and Marcy, just north of the new Burlington Station. Well, the train station uh, served like our airports do today. Uh, the major form of long distance travel was on trains. And of course, people um, getting off the train, that would be the first impression that they would have of a city. So again, any city that aspired to any kind of status uh, would have a grandiose train station. Another proponent of classical revival style buildings was John Latenzer, a fourth generation architect and stonecutter. He had immigrated from Liechtenstein in the 1880s. In the 1890s, he supervised construction of the Omaha Post Office. Then he was chosen to design a replacement for the 30-year-old, overcrowded Omaha High School. The school was constructed one wing at a time over 12 years. It was built around the old building, which was then torn down to create a central courtyard. Latenzer thought the site on top of Capitol Hill was too high for students to walk up to every day. The land, donated to the city by the legislature when the Capitol moved to Lincoln, came with the stipulation that the hill could not be cut down. But Latenzer accidentally dug the basement too deep. He then admitted his error and was forced to lower the hill. Well, of course, in many ways, the high school in the turn of the century was such a major institution, almost equivalent to a college institution today. For some, it was the, the end of education, and for others, it was the preparatory stage towards a career in, uh, in a university. Latenzer's career centered on large public buildings. 
Omaha High School, later called Central High, was one of over 35 public school buildings Latenzer designed. As the school rose, Latenzer designed a city auditorium which was built at 15th and Howard. Then he received a private commission for a retail store to be built on a scale to rival his civic buildings. The Brandeis family, Omaha's most successful retailers, had outgrown their third building. Brandeis and Sons were Omaha innovators, using elaborate window displays to attract customers and putting pictures in their newspaper ads. The new Brandeis store opened in 1906. It was in this classical style building that most Omahans first experienced such marvels as escalators and air conditioning. The large retail establishment um, exploded in the late 19th century. And the idea was almost everything under one roof. And the multi-story, um, grandiose building of retail establishment again became a symbol of the cultured city. At first, the Brandeis store occupied just three floors and the basement. It was so successful that by the 1920s, merchandise filled the entire building, including a two-story addition. The Brandeis store at 16th and Douglas was really one of the central attractions of the downtown shopping dist district, which ran along 16th Street. Uh, it attracted other stores to downtown. Of course, at that time, because downtown was so easily accessible by streetcar, that was the primary retail shopping area in the city. The unquestioned center of Omaha was where the streetcar lines converged at 16th and Farnham. A block to the west stood the second Douglas County Courthouse. In the 1880s, it had been praised as a building for the ages. Just 30 years later, the city had outgrown it. John Latenzer was commissioned to design a new courthouse. As had been done with the high school, the new courthouse was built around the old one. It's noted for many unique architectural features, including its grand rotunda, mosaic floors, and detailed stonework inside and out. It's a prime example of a classical revival style building. The classical style is uh, characterized by monumentality, by a grandeur of scale, a polished quality of materials, a refinement of finishing that absolutely demands uh, wealth in order to produce it at all. And if you have wealth uh, accumulated or produced in your community, one way to let the world know that you have it is by having buildings which do display it that way. The craftsmen played a monumental role in our architecture when it came to all the details. They were the ones who interpolated the one-dimensional drawings and made it a three-dimensional piece of art. You know, that's when it becomes a work of architecture. Economic growth and inexpensive skilled labor made classical revival architecture possible. The style was part of a national City Beautiful movement. The City Beautiful movement got started with really a couple of, of factors. One, people recognized that cities were not necessarily that nice a place to live with the growth and expansion that had occurred throughout the 19th century. But then secondly, the World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago tried to portray what cities could be with uh, greater open spaces and parks and boulevards and fine civic buildings. So that became a type of image to try and change. Uh, what cities had become by that time. The Omaha Park Commission, organized by the late 80s, played an important role in reshaping Omaha. One member was Dr. George L. Miller, Omaha's first physician, a territorial legislator and co-founder of the Omaha Daily Herald. He convinced the commission to hire landscape architect H.W.S. Cleveland, who had designed parks and boulevard systems in Chicago, St. Paul, and Minneapolis. 
A park system was planned for Omaha that encompassed the whole city. Riverview Park, Kuntz Park, Elmwood Park, Hanscom Park. After the turn of the century, these and other parks were reshaped by grading and landscaping and then connected by an extensive boulevard system. It was a landmark in landscape design and urban planning in the Midwest. In 1901, Catholic Bishop Richard Scannell proposed building a cathedral on the western edge of the city at 40th and Burt Streets to replace St. Philomena's on South 9th Street. The diocese received a letter. I have set my heart on building this building for you, and I want to at least feel that if it should not so work out, I have not myself to blame in this matter. I am absolutely certain that I could do justice to the problem. Thomas Kimball. Kimball received the commission. He broke with the classical look, employing a Spanish Renaissance revival style in homage to the Spanish explorer Coronado, said to be the first European in the Great Plains. On October 6, 1907, archbishops, bishops, and 30,000 spectators witnessed the cornerstone being laid for St. Cecilia's Cathedral. The bishop declared that work would only be done as funds became available. The cathedral could not be used regularly for 10 years. The massive domed twin towers were not completed until 1959, 25 years after Kimball's death. St. Cecilia's is such a, a wonderful building because uh, it, it perfectly expresses the real genius of that architect, Thomas Kimball. Uh, it's such a, a very grand building with those very high towers and huge interior spaces. Uh, the uh, permanent, impressive materials and then the very, very fine details in both the overall planning by Thomas Kimball and then the execution by the artists of the parts of the sanctuary and the aisles, the windows, the, uh, all the structural and, and the decorative details are, are so sophisticated. And you move through St. Cecilia's and you have the combination of a deep spiritual experience with a wonder at the uh, material achievement in very rich stone. As work on the new cathedral began, down near the riverfront stood St. Philomena's Cathedral. It was surrounded by warehouses and sat two short blocks from a concentration of saloons, gambling houses, and brothels. In 1907, St. Philomena's Parish moved to a new building at 10th and William, also designed by Kimball. The old downtown cathedral was raised, and in its place, the huge John Deere building rose. The railroads continued to make Omaha attractive to distributors of all kinds of products. By 1910, the area east of 10th Street was taken over by massive warehouses employing thousands of workers. Between 1900 and 1916, Omaha's wholesaling industry tripled its sales. Increasing insurance costs forced companies to look for ways to make warehouses more fireproof. Sprinkler systems and brick-enclosed stairways became common. Steel replaced wood frames and load-bearing walls, and freight elevators allowed for taller structures. More than anything, the Jobbers Canyon on 9th Street really reflected strength, stability, solidity, permanence, the impact of these very strong, permanent buildings truthfully created a canyon. West of the warehouse district, downtown Omaha was building up as well. 
after about 1910, it was clear that some of the focus in the city had started to change, and I think that was shown in the skyscrapers that were built. They were truly monuments to business, as opposed to monuments to governments or great civic buildings. As late as 1910, the New York Life Building was still the tallest in Omaha. Then came the 16-story City National Bank Building at 16th and Harney, Omaha's first true skyscraper. The Woodman of the World Building at 14th and Farnham, constructed two years after the City National Building, was two stories higher, the tallest building between Chicago and the West Coast. The first National Bank of Omaha building on the southwest corner of 16th and Farnham followed in 1916. Its H-shaped design and material specifications were in direct response to a deadly Easter Sunday tornado which had hit Omaha in 1913. This bank was designed to withstand the worst windstorm the planes could throw at it. The Woodman, the City National, and First National buildings were a new type of structure made possible by new building technologies. The structural systems made the skyscraper possible and, and using steel in new ways. We used the masonry very heavily as load-bearing walls with some steel in them and the skyscraper went to just a steel structure with maybe masonry applied as a skin that hung off of the structure rather than being the structure itself. Steel frames freed architects and builders from the limitations inherent in piling one stone upon another. This technology made possible what we think of today as a city skyline. In 1914, Gurdon Waddles organized a group of businessmen to construct a hotel at 18th and Douglas on a corner lot donated by Arthur Brandeis. As he had with the Expo, Waddles turned to architect Thomas Kimball. They looked to Nebraska history for inspiration. It was called the Hotel Fontanelle. The unique three-story white terracotta cap symbolized the headdress of Omaha Indian Chief Logan Fontenelle. We are gathered here tonight for the purpose of celebrating one of the most important achievements of the public-spirited citizens of this community. This hotel stands as a monument of their enterprise. I congratulate them on the completion of a hotel in our city of which they all may be proud. Gurdon Wattles. The Hotel Fontenelle became a social center. President Woodrow Wilson was one of its first visitors in 1916. Farther west, the Blackstone Hotel was opened that same year, providing hotel service to well-to-do people leasing a year at a time. The apartments did not have kitchens, nor did they need them. The Blackstone Kitchen was renowned for its food and has been credited with the creation of the Reuben Sandwich and Butter Brickle Ice Cream. After a few years, the hotel welcomed overnight guests. The Blackstone became the place for social events and fine dining and for the city's famous visitors to stay. The Blackstone Hotel, uh, like uh, the construction of some of the major churches, uh, was an indicator that uh, Omaha was uh, pushing uh, beyond uh, the area fairly close to the Missouri River and was beginning the process of uh, spreading much farther across the western hills. By the end of the First World War, Omaha had annexed communities to the north, south, and west. Its schools were bursting at the seams. Four high schools were built in four years. John Latenzer, now working with his two sons, was commissioned to design both North High School and South High. The new Benson High was designed by Omaha architect Alan McDonald. 
Well, there are a number of reasons that the number of high schools increased in Omaha during the 1920s. Uh, one was the physical growth of the city through annexation. Another important reason was um, the new societal pressures that asked students to get more education. Thirdly, curriculum changes in the sense that vocational education uh, became very important. Omaha architects Frederick and Edwin Clark won the commission for Technical High School at 33rd and Burt. It had a 2,000-seat auditorium, a greenhouse, two pools, two gyms, and 12 science labs. At $3 million, it cost almost as much as the other three schools put together. By 1920, recently annexed South Omaha was the second largest livestock market in the world. Ten packing houses within blocks of the stockyards employed over 12,000 workers. The armor plant had 1.5 million square feet of workspace. The Cudahy plant covered 46 acres with 15 buildings. By the time that the big packers came to Omaha, the packing industry was one of the major industries in the United States. It operated on a large scale, and so that the plants that were established here are, are massive, you know, about six stories high. Uh, at one time, they were state-of-the-art in the industry. A new building was needed to replace the Livestock Exchange Building from the 1880s. Union Stockyards President Everett Buckingham dreamed of one that would symbolize the strength of the stockyards. Ground was broken in 1924 for an 11-story building designed in a northern Italian style that would tower over 140 acres and 2,000 pens. Buckingham never saw his dream realized. He passed away before the building was completed in 1926. Every step in the construction of this structure represents permanence and stability, and it stands as a tower of strength to the great industry which made its construction possible. Omaha's Own Magazine, 1926. The Livestock Exchange Building was designed by George Prince, former assistant to Thomas Kimball. The towering symbol of South Omaha was home to the Stockyards National Bank a soda fountain, a convention hall, and a ballroom. Now that urban prosperity and leisure time were on the rise, people wanted entertainment. Vaudeville was in full swing. By the 1920s, motion pictures, which had started out in cheap storefront Nickelodeons, were so popular movie houses were going up all over town and owners of even the largest vaudeville theaters were adding movie screens. Every neighborhood had its theater, but for a real treat, people went downtown to Theater Row, centered along Douglas and Farnham streets. There they found movie palaces like the Riviera, the World, the Sun, the Orpheum, the Rialto, and others. Some could seat nearly 3,000 people. Each of Omaha's movie palaces had its own personality. The Riviera, later the Paramount, and still later the Astro, was renowned for its unusual Moorish and Venetian design. The world was easily recognized by the three-story arched windows above the marquee, framed by stately Corinthian columns. The Lowe brothers, who had one of the very largest chains of motion picture theaters across the whole United States, took the attitude that you did not go to see the movie. Uh, your ticket bought you the experience of going to the theater. And when you went to the theater, you escaped from the humdrum, ordinary life. One of the grandest theaters was the Orpheum, opened in 1892 as the Creighton Theater. It originally featured vaudeville acts and musical performances. 
Its entrance was on 15th Street. Then the City National Bank was built over and around the theater. In 1927, the Orpheum was rebuilt. Its entrance moved to 16th Street. No expense was spared in finishing the opulent interior. Gold leaf and ivory were everywhere. Patrons sat amid rich drapery and walls of silver brocade and looked up at the deep gold canopy with its huge cut crystal chandelier. Such palaces were symbols of the economic and cultural power of the movie industry. In the late 1920s, 110 million movie tickets were sold every week in this country. The total population was around 120 million. Movie stars, flappers, hot jazz, fast cars. In the 1920s, there was a fascination with the modern, the streamlined, the efficient. A uniquely American style of architecture emerged, Art Deco. The new Nebraska State Capitol in Lincoln was acclaimed nationwide. The Art Deco style that became predominant in the 1920s really reflected a, a new age, a new approach to things. It was clearly 20th century. Everything before the World War had been 19th century, but Art Deco suddenly appeared on the new and the modern buildings that were being constructed in the 1920s. In Omaha, a prime example of Art Deco was Joslin Memorial, built west of Central High School on Dodge Street. It was built in memory of newspaper publisher and businessman George Joslin, who had amassed the largest personal fortune in Nebraska. George and his wife Sarah shared a love of music and art. After he died in 1916, Sarah went to the architect who had designed the Joslin's mansion some 15 years earlier, John McDonald. With Sarah's input, McDonald and his son Alan designed a home for Omaha's arts. I have wanted to do something for Omaha because it is my home. My friends are here and it is the city I love. Sarah Joslin. Over 250 rail cars of marble were used. Georgia pink marble outside, massive black and gold marble columns from Italy framing the fountain court inside. Sarah considered the concert hall the heart of the building. Galleries surrounded it, with a lecture hall below. Sarah refused to call the building a museum or a gallery, or any title that would limit it. In 1931, the $2.6 million gift to the city was complete. The Joslin Museum is unquestionably one of the most important buildings we have in the state. Its location there and its general size makes it an imposing piece with a tremendous scale. Then the material, that beautiful marble, is so impressive and long-lasting. And then finally, the sophistication of the design by the McDonald's, which uh, includes uh, uh, a, a Greek kind of portico uh, with some Egyptian details to the whole building as well as an Art Deco uh, element to the design. It's uh, uh, efficient and almost unforgettable as an image for the city. The Union Pacific Railroad hired noted ultra-modern architect Gilbert Stanley Underwood of Los Angeles to design a new Omaha station to replace its turn-of-the-century station at 10th and Marcy. January 15, 1931. 50,000 people attend the dedication of the new UP station. It's an Art Deco monument to the people and forces that built the railroad. Above the west entrance, a civil engineer and a track worker are memorialized, with a conductor and locomotive engineer along the north side. The terminal could handle 8,000 passengers and 90 trains a day. In the great days of the railroads, uh, railroad stations were meant for congestion. And if you have lots of people crowded together horizontally, the people psychologically are going to feel oppressed 
unless that at least vertically uh, they have a sense of space. And that's, that's what you have in the grand concourses uh, where they have to spend some time. Just south of the Union Station, the Burlington Station was remodeled. The columns were removed, the building's capacity was increased, and its look modernized. But in the process, the Kimball touches that had made it unique were lost. Through 30 years of annexation and growth, Omaha had doubled its population to 214,000. It was a time of building on a grand scale. Then came the early 30s and the Depression. Farmers had suffered through the 20s. In the 30s, things got worse. Farm prices, already low, plummeted further. Drought hit, along with record high temperatures, dust storms, and grasshoppers. The grain and livestock markets floundered. Banks closed their doors, unemployment soared. For the most part, private construction came to a standstill. But the government was building. Projects included a county hospital and a new federal office building. What really happened is that building shifted into the public sector during the New Deal but it wasn't at the grandiose level. It was things associated with the Works Progress Administration, uh, which would build uh, schools and airports and uh, sewage treatment plants and water facilities and public housing. One federal project through the Public Works Administration was a collaborative effort with the city on the west edge of town. The 30-year-old Municipal University of Omaha was housed in buildings scattered throughout the city. Then in 1938, a combination classroom and administration building was dedicated north of Elmwood Park on 60th and Dodge. The designer of the Georgian-style building was Frank Latenzer, son of John. He was a fifth-generation architect from the Latenzer family. There was some private construction during the 30s. A new office building went up west of downtown for the companies that would one day be called Mutual of Omaha. But businesses that could afford such investments were few. Then, with the dawn of the 40s, buildings sprouted like mushrooms south of Omaha, in Bellevue. During 1941, nearly 50 buildings, totaling over 2 million square feet, were built at Fort Crook. It was the Glen L. Martin Nebraska Bomber Plant. Europe and Asia were at war. America was treading a fine line shipping supplies to allies while staying out of the fight. But on December 7th, the fight came to America. The nation's resources went to the war effort. After World War II, the country was changed. It was the end of an era, a time of economic expansion when a few talented artists and an army of low-paid, skilled workers served a growing government, prosperous businesses, and a handful of spectacularly wealthy individuals who wanted to make a statement about who they were and what they had accomplished. Go west.
West, young man, was a national catchphrase throughout the second half of the 19th century. Hundreds of thousands heeded the call. The Missouri River, the Great Platte River Road, and later the Union Pacific Railroad made Omaha a regional transportation hub. And local transportation, or lack of it, dictated where and how people would live in the Gate City. During the city's first three decades, the Gold Rush, the Homestead Act, and the Railroad brought large numbers of people to and through Omaha. Many were not the sodbuster pioneers of American folklore. The, the first people that would actually move to Omaha would be individuals uh, looking to take advantage from a frontier land developers, lawyers, uh, and so forth, uh, trying to establish uh, their first business, people on the make. So it, it was an urban frontier. Speculators bought as much land as they could afford in the city or around it. As the city grew, their fortunes grew. In those early days, Omaha City was a typical frontier town, with shops, homes, and factories mixed together, all within walking distance. The walking city is an urban historian's term to describe the type of city that existed before the advent of transportation lines. People needed to live close to work so that they could walk to any place they needed to go, whether to the store, to work, or to other places. So we refer to it as the walking city. Within the hodgepodge of businesses, residences, and mud streets called Omaha, newcomers lived somewhere, anywhere, until they got on their feet. In cheap hotels, boarding houses, rooms above stores, crude shacks, and a few real homes. In the first couple of decades when Omaha was developing, there were a lot of people who weren't sure if the community was going to survive. The amount of cost to import the wood to build it and construct a home was uh, substantial. As a result, boarding houses and hotels became sort of a stopgap measure for people who might be ready to move on at any time. Life was long on hard work and short on comfort and hygiene. The only respite from the constant dust came with the rains when the streets turned to mud. A smoky haze rose from a forest of chimneys. Chamber pots were emptied into alleys next to open-backed outhouses. In Omaha, the young wives found two or three room homes scattered here or there on the prairie without water, light, or heat, except from cisterns or wells, kerosene lamps, and wood stoves. Josie McCullough. Omaha was not a pretty place, but it did have the railroad, and that meant opportunity. European immigrants from Germany and Scandinavia and Ireland uh, and uh, other areas, but particularly those uh, uh, three, uh, came to Omaha, I'm sure, if one could uh, judge their uh, motives uh, in retrospect, uh, largely because it was a community that was growing and offered economic opportunities. Immigrants learned of the promise of Omaha and the West from newspapers. Nearly every ethnic group in Omaha had one. Copies were sent east and on to Europe, telling family and friends about America. The Croatian paper and the Czech papers uh, went as far as uh, New York City itself. And that is one reason why many of, of, of the Czechs really felt that Omaha was as big as New York because of the newspapers. They were as essential as television is today in attracting persons to different places. Omaha's Union Station had a separate immigrant waiting room. It was a busy place. The conductor hollered, Omaha! But I knew he had to be mistaken. I could see the station house was just a little shack. Omaha was supposed to be a giant city. 
I refused to get off the train until Joe Mick came into the car looking for me. Simon Rokosek. Joe Mick was a station master at Union Station. A Czech immigrant himself, he helped many new Czech arrivals get established. He'd walk them through Bohemian Town, as it was called, centered around 13th and William, and perhaps take them to St. Wenceslaus Church. Each ethnic group had advocates similar to Joe Mick, and each had a church which was the center of activity. Places of worship provide a permanent record of who came to Omaha and when. Omaha's first cathedral, St. Philomena's, became a largely Irish congregation. A second parish soon followed. By 1870, three Lutheran churches marked the coming of the Swedes, Danes, and Norwegians. German Protestants settled north of Dodge Street, German Catholics to the south, Within 20 years, they had built five churches. They were resettling uh, persons who would come from afar, i.e., whether it's a Catholic or whether Eastern European or whether it was a Scandinavian church. And they served uh, and as a total entity for the families. So the churches were like settlement houses, uh, social centers. Uh, they were the alpha and the omega of, of life, period. In 1880, ethnic churches were thriving. Immigrants and their offspring accounted for over half of the city's population. As Omaha grew, many of the speculators, professionals, and railroad officials who had come to Omaha in its earliest days were wealthy enough to afford horses and carriages. They took advantage of the open space at the edge of town away from the dirt and noise of the city. There they constructed homes with expansive lawns and gardens, carriage houses, and servants' quarters. Some built homes south of town, others built to the north, but most settled on the western hills near the territorial capital. By 1880, Omaha was home to 30,000 people. It became impractical to walk across the city. Then a new technology came along which changed the shape of the city, made fortunes for some landowners, and transformed city life forever. The electric streetcar. The first street railways, running as early as 1868, were horse-drawn cars, too expensive for regular use by the average citizen. By the 1880s, cable cars ran on some of Omaha's steep hills. Then in the late 80s, electric cars came along. They were more powerful than horse-drawn cars and certainly left the streets cleaner. Short stretches of track crisscrossed the city, each route run by a different company. But by 1901, the city's streetcar lines were consolidated into the Omaha and Council Bluffs Street Railway Company under the leadership of Gurdon Waddles. Well, the streetcar was one of the decentralizers of a city. Obviously, at the beginning, um, companies, traction companies, would follow pre-existing major streets that had been used by the horse and buggy and so forth, but then developers, of course, uh, land developers wanting to build homes would get an extension out and then that would ensure that people followed it. Downtown, the old walking city changed, growing more and more congested. The coming of the streetcar helped. It meant shopkeepers, office workers, and skilled laborers could live elsewhere, as the wealthy always had. Developers were quick to serve this new middle class, platting over 80 new areas for homes. In 1880, there was a total of 5,100 homes in the city. Between 1885 and 1890, 9,000 homes were built. The city's population tripled. The 1880s was the greatest real estate boom that anyone had ever seen in Omaha. Uh, everybody became a real estate agent suddenly, and everyone who had any land whatsoever was making sure that it was being subdivided into lots and blocks and trying to sell it to the first person who came their way. 
the boom didn't last. Financial panic struck the nation in 93. Unemployment rose. Newly laid streetcar tracks to western subdivisions rusted from disuse and lots sat vacant. By the time of the exposition in 1898, the economy was turning around. As the depression lifted, neighborhoods branched out near every streetcar line. Every neighborhood needed a business district within walking distance of every house. Before refrigerators, grocery shopping was a daily chore. Omaha grew steadily for the next 30 years. Though the developing neighborhoods had much in common, each had its own story. North of town, just west of 16th Street, on land he had purchased 20 years before, banker Herman Kuntz started Kuntz Place in 1883. He knew the kind of community he wanted to build. The development of Kuntz Place in the 1880s was a real large-scale development for that time. It was large, it was a quarter section of land, 160 acres, and one of the first times that an entire subdivision was being platted or laid out into lots and blocks at one time. And it was also interesting in that they put restrictive covenants on the properties, uh, determining how much the houses should cost, uh, indicating that no bars or saloons could be located in the neighborhood. Fanciful Queen Anne-style homes sprang up as businessmen and professionals searched for the genteel country life. The Queen Anne was the high style of the 1880s. It showed that you had made it. The Queen Anne is, of course, a very interesting style that both the connoisseurs and amateur lovers of architecture enjoy because it really represents uh, two possibilities. It's very ornamental and ornate so that there's a lot of play of light and shadow and decorative quality to it. But at the same time, uh, because it was m depended on machine-made materials, it really wasn't too expensive or too difficult to uh, produce for middle-class housing. When bad economic times hit in the 90s, the growth of Kuntz Place slowed. In 1897, Kuntz's real estate company sold a parcel of land to the city for one dollar. It became the site of the main lagoon of the Trans-Mississippi and International Exposition. Streetcar tracks were laid between the exposition grounds and downtown Omaha along 16th and 24th streets. When it was over, the expo buildings were dismantled. The lagoon filled in and turned into Kuntz Park, but the streetcar tracks stayed. As the economy turned around, developments like Kuntz Place took off. George Bemis ran a successful real estate company and was elected mayor of Omaha in 1892. Dr. Samuel Mercer was a business leader and the founder of the city's first hospital. In 1889, they combined land they owned north and west of town into a development called Bemis Park. Their timing was poor. The Depression came in the 90s, and Mercer's own 23-room mansion and a single Queen Anne home stood alone in Bemis Park for a decade. But Mercer didn't give up. He was one of the organizers behind the citywide streetcar company and a major streetcar line was built down Cumming Street, right by Bemis Park. When the economy turned around, the development was replatted and lot prices cut. It soon filled up. The Bemis Park subdivision was the first subdivision in Omaha that tried to respect the topography rather than laying out all the streets at right angles, irregardless of hills or rivers or ravines or anything else. In Bemis Park, they took the very deep ravine uh, near Cumming Street and made it into a city park and then ran the streets around it, curving around the hills rather than trying to cut through them. So that rather distinctive street layout really identified Bemis Park as a, a very unique subdivision. In the 1880s, Henry Yates built a mansion west of town on Davenport at 31st Street. 
In the 1890s, civic leader Gurdon Waddles and meatpacker Edward Cudahy built mansions nearby, just west of 32nd Street along Farnham. After the turn of the century, the Storrs, Millard, Brandeis, Kuntz, Metz, and Rosewater families followed. Their homes were designed by Omaha's most prestigious architects. The West Farnham area picked up the nickname the Gold Coast. In many cases for those houses, the people who lived in them, did uh, rich as they were and social leaders as they were, did not have uh, a deep cultural background. So to have a house that had an art gallery or looked like a French chateau or had the elegant furnishings that spoke of deep culture of the past was one way uh, to, uh, to, in a way, cover up your own lack of, uh, of cultural polish. As the neighborhood grew, churches like Kuntz Memorial Lutheran and First Presbyterian Church left the downtown area following their congregations west. In 1916, the towering Blackstone Hotel gave the district a new name, the Blackstone Area. North of the West Farnham neighborhood at 40th and Davenport, George and Sarah Joslin built their castle in 1903. It was designed in the Scotch baronial style, influenced by Andrew Carnegie's East Coast and Scottish estates. Joslin took John MacDonald to the East Coast so the architect could see firsthand the type of house Joslin wanted in Omaha. Five blocks north of the Joslin Castle, St. Cecilia's Cathedral was going up. By 1916, when first services were held in the cathedral, there was a string of mansions along 38th Street, surrounded by an upper middle class neighborhood. Developments like Kuntz Place and Bemis Park, and areas like West Farnham and Cathedral were Omaha neighborhoods. Other developments, though also made possible by streetcars, were separate towns. In 1887, Iowan Erastus Benson purchased a 900-acre farm along the military road that had been constructed in the 1850s to supply Fort Kearney. Benson platted a village, complete with its own downtown, and named it after himself. He formed the Benson Motor Railway Company to build a streetcar line connecting the village to Omaha. Benson uh, really developed as a community on its own, serving the farmers of Northwest Douglas County. Certainly that was a rural farming area, and uh, as a result, Benson was much more of a small town, had a much more developed uh, Main Street business district, and had an economy of its own, as opposed to being really dependent on Omaha for its livelihood. By 1920, over 5,000 people lived in Benson primarily in single-family bungalows on compact 50-foot lots. The business district on Maple Street was growing, the Bank of Benson was booming, and the Benson Times circulation was increasing. The streetcar line between Benson and downtown Omaha was busy, especially in the summer, when Omaha residents flocked to a park owned by Omaha brewer Fred Krug. Krug Park, around 52nd and Military, grew from a dance hall and beer garden to an amusement park complete with games, rides, and a swimming pool, featuring what was advertised as germ-free water. Chlorination was a new technology. In the summer of 1930, an accident on the Krug Park roller coaster killed four people. The bathhouse burned down in 32. The park never recovered and closed its gates in 1940. In the 1880s, west of town, early Omaha settler and land speculator John Nelson Hayes Patrick owned a 33-room Victorian mansion surrounded by over 800 acres. 
he teamed up with some Kansas City investors, divided a portion of his land west of 48th Street into lots, and called it Dundee Place after a successful Kansas City development. Sales of lots were slow until after the turn of the century, when Omaha's Street Railway Company ran tracks to the heart of Dundee. The Dundee area is unique. It developed over a 40-year period, creating a mix of architectural styles seen nowhere else in the city. It provides a record of how home styles changed over time. As Omaha stretched west along the streetcar tracks, the streetcar line on 24th Street became a major north-south artery, connecting downtown to the diverse neighborhoods of Omaha's north side and the city of South Omaha. From the beginning, South Omaha was a separate town created by and for an industry, meatpacking. On South 24th, just a few blocks east of the stockyards, a busy business district developed. Developers hoped for orderly housing developments around the stockyards and business district. Instead, as laborers poured in, cottages and cheap boarding houses sprang up anywhere there was an open plot. Bohemians, Poles, Italians, Lithuanians, Hungarians, Romanians, Greeks, Jews, Blacks, and later Mexicans all made the area south of downtown Omaha, together with South Omaha, the most ethnically diverse area in the state. Neighborhoods had names like Greek Town, Little Poland, and Little Italy. When the new immigrants came to the United States, they settled in urban areas, but very often these were people of rural backgrounds. They're coming into an entirely new culture, and so they try to keep as much as they can of the old ways. And we will see this in their attempts to establish uh, ethnic uh, uh, parishes. We'll see it in, in the establishment of ethnic fraternal orders. Newcomers gravitated to the churches and shops which offered familiar customs and language. At community centers, lodges, and social halls, people gathered for many purposes and interests. There were clubs for music, dance, cycling, athletics, business, many tied to a distinct ethnic heritage. In 1900, Omaha had 24 different clubs just for people of German descent. Churches, local stores, and meeting halls were the centers of activity in Omaha's ethnic communities. A handful of Jews had come to Omaha in its earliest days from East Coast cities, pioneers rather than immigrants. By the mid-1880s, the first Temple Israel stood at 23rd and Harney. In 1908, the congregation replaced the aging wood building with a Latenzer-designed temple at Park Avenue and Jackson. During the 1890s, a second wave of Jews started coming to Omaha, this time directly from Eastern Europe. New synagogues were established near downtown often bearing the stamp of the country their congregation came from. After the turn of the century, there was a gradual migration of synagogues from the area south of the wholesale district to the near north side. By the mid-teens, there was a busy string of Jewish businesses along North 24th Street, serving the diverse North Omaha community. African Americans had also been in Omaha from the very beginning but the real growth of the black community came after the turn of the century. Hard times for the South's cotton industry, along with Northern industry's hunger for labor, resulted in a great migration North. Between 1910 and 1920, Omaha's black population doubled. Most settled near South Omaha's packing plants or on Omaha's North side. Again, churches provide a record. 
at the church, uh, you uh, had to become registered to vote. Uh, you, you, you got your care packages. Uh, you got a place to live because the persons that uh, uh, were running this church, Zion Church and Pilgrim Church and um, St. John Church, had a list uh, of, of persons who you could stay with. It became the, the, the family, the extended family that was needed so desperately by Omaha's uh, migrating from uh, the South. By the end of the 20s, there were over 40 black congregations. Some, like North Omaha's Pilgrim Baptist Church, bought buildings from white congregations moving west. Others constructed new buildings. Omaha's oldest black congregation, St. John's African Methodist Episcopal Church, built a notable example of prairie school architecture on North 22nd Street. Black professionals and entrepreneurs developed their own thriving business district along North 24th Street. Its centerpiece was the Jewel Building, built in 1927. It was home to the Dreamland Ballroom, where many of the greatest black entertainers appeared. As rural Americans and immigrants poured into cities, they brought with them the desire for a place they could call their own. Well, I think in, in regard to uh, both checks and polls, for example, uh, they often came of peasant stock and uh, having a piece of land would be very important to them. When they came over here, uh, they worked very hard uh, to buy a home. They might be small homes, uh, but the whole family uh, worked at that. By the 1880s, the one-story worker's cottage brought the American dream of home ownership to the working class. It was a rectangular box, deeper than it was wide to fit in a narrow lot, with a roofed porch across the front. Decorative millwork such as turned columns, spindles, and fish scale shingles were used, sparingly, to personalize it. Workers' cottages were built throughout the city, near every streetcar line. By the turn of the century, the workers' cottage had grown to the one and a half story. For larger two-story homes, the classic box was the style of choice. It easily fit onto smaller lots and could be detailed elaborately or quite simply. One feature common to most homes of that era was the front porch. Well, the porch was really your front door on the world in the way that you could interact with your neighbors in the neighborhood. People did not use their backyards as we might do now as a place of refuge. I think another aspect of, of porches that we don't always remember is that there was no air conditioning at that time. For people to get the summer breezes, uh, they needed to be outdoors. Home ownership was a source of pride to Americans at all economic levels. After the turn of the century, new national publications appeared. House Beautiful, Craftsman Magazine, and The Bungalow Book extolled the virtues of homes that were simple and utilitarian. When a style is found to be original and vital, it is a certainty that it has sprung from the needs of the plain people and that it is based upon the simplest and most direct principles of construction. Gustav Stickley, designer and publisher, Craftsman Magazine. In those days, the Aladdin Company, Sears, and others sold mail-order homes in kit form to do-it-yourselfers. In the 1920s, a man following step-by-step -step instructions could build his family a home from pre-cut materials for just a few hundred dollars. The worker's cottage, the classic box, the bungalow, all helped bring the American dream of home ownership to the people of Omaha. In 1880, one-third of Omahans owned their own home. By 1920, half did. The single-family dwelling wasn't for everyone. In the late 1890s, the Sherman was constructed north of downtown along the streetcar line on 16th Street. It was Omaha's first apartment building. 
Well, apartments started to develop in conjunction with the streetcar lines as well, because a good number of people could live in one location and ride the streetcar to work. In larger cities, they had had tenements before, but in Omaha, really, the multifamily construction took the form of apartment buildings along the streetcar lines. A few blocks south of the Sherman, Robert Strelo, a German immigrant who had constructed buildings for the Trans-Mississippi Exposition, began erecting Omaha's first apartment complex in 1905. By 1916, the Strelo Terrace Apartments consisted of five buildings surrounding a courtyard, complete with tennis courts, a playground, and a community house. Apartment complexes sprang up near every streetcar line. One ambitious developer, realtor William Drake, erected over 1,100 apartment units during the teens and 20s. His largest complex was Drake Court Apartments at 20th and Leavenworth. With its landscaped courtyard and well-appointed interiors, it was aimed at the discriminating renter. The streetcar helped change Omaha from a single, compact community to a collection of communities, all tied together by a transportation system with its heart downtown. Then, a newer technology came along that would change the shape of the city again, the automobile. In the beginning, the automobile was just a curiosity that frightened horses. Then in 1909, Henry Ford introduced the Model T. As years went by and more and more were sold, the price went down cars were within reach of the middle class, and all the rules changed. Once streets were paved, developers were free to build even where there were no streetcar tracks. Plus, thanks to the newfangled refrigerator, people no longer needed a store within a few minutes walk. New kinds of neighborhoods developed. In 1915, in a cornfield north of Omaha along 30th Street, developer Charles Martin platted an area called Minilusa, meaning clear water. He put in sidewalks, fire hydrants, and a clubhouse for residents. By the early 1920s, over 600 homes were built. If you like to see things grow, to plant and to harvest, to help yourself, your neighbor, and your country, to build up financial independence, to breathe deep of pure country air, to say, this is my own, come out to Minilusa. Charles Martin. The Minilusa subdivision was developed as a middle-class subdivision and a very large area that developed in a relatively short period of time with homogeneous architectural styles. It was also aimed at the middle classes and people who would have automobiles, and so each house was built with a garage as well. So it had a variety of factors that really set it apart from other subdivision development prior to that time. The success of Minnelusa prompted similar developments all around the city. The lots were small, Homes usually modest and very much alike, but they sold. In these suburbs, a middle-class family could afford a scaled-down version of a country estate, complete with a scaled-down version of a carriage house, a garage for the new status symbol that made it all possible. To the west, older developments grew and new ones were platted. As land became more valuable, the Omaha and Happy Hollow country clubs moved. Farmers' fields were subdivided. The resulting developments catered to a growing wealthy and upper middle class. Real estate marketing became more sophisticated. In developments like Country Club along North 56th Street, curved streets reflected the garden suburb ideal and a style of architecture was promoted which played on the idea that every man's home is his castle. Well, whereas the bungalow style or the uh, international style of the 1930s had really no particular historical references, uh, the 
uh, English Tudor style evokes so such uh, so many memories of uh, a romantic period in history, knights in armor, and whether it's a peasant's cottage that still has the sense of charm, each man's home is his castle, or a truly impressive manor house, you have a connection for the average American with a long and a rather glamorized history. On both sides of Dodge Street, out to 72nd and beyond, other park-like subdivisions appeared. Fair Acres, Beverly Hills, and Buena Vista were considered ideal neighborhoods, stately homes on large lots. To the south along Pacific Street, the area around Archibald Love's farm home became the Loveland development. Omaha's population growth was slowing, but geographically the city was spreading as never before. New apartment buildings, rows of bungalows, and Tudor homes in fresh suburban surroundings. In the 20s, urban middle-class Americans were living better than ever. Many invested in the booming stock market. But rural America was struggling. Then, in 29, the economy came crashing down. The Depression. Rural Nebraska was hit by drought, which created the Dust Bowl, heaping misery upon misery. Omaha businesses faltered. People were thrown out of work. Back in a good economic year, 1925, over 1,800 building permits for new homes had been issued. In 1934, there were just 96. President Franklin Roosevelt's Work Projects Administration helped put men to work on parks and public buildings. In 1934, the Federal Housing Authority was created. It loaned up to 90% of the cost of a new home. Then in the late 30s, WPA workers built the Logan Fontenelle Housing Project off North 24th Street and the Southside Terrace Project in South Omaha near the packing plants. These complexes provided hundreds of new apartments to a wide range of poor and newly impoverished people. Public housing came near the end of the nation's long, hard climb out of the Depression. Then, Omaha and the nation started gearing up for an event that would change everything. The Second World War. During the war, men of different ethnic backgrounds who never had any reason to know each other before lived, worked, and fought side by side. After the war, the GI Bill provided them an education and helped them build new homes in the rapidly spreading suburbs. Omaha's old ethnic neighborhoods began to disperse. New ethnic groups moved in, putting their mark on the city. Almost everyone bought an automobile, or two. Cars and buses killed the street railways. Cars and the airlines put an end to the era of passenger rail travel and grand train stations. The airport became the gateway to the city. People could drive to a worship service anywhere in the city, and they looked to the government for some of the social services that churches had provided in years gone by. Before the war, people walked to neighborhood stores. Soon, stores were built that couldn't be approached on foot. Once, most major businesses had to be located downtown, close to the river and the rails. Then, industrial parks began to appear at the edges of the city. Goods could be moved by truck. The towering building had been the ultimate symbol of economic power. Now, some choose the corporate campus to make their statement. The downtown changed again. Old buildings gave way to new, and a park was carved out. A new type of building dotted the landscape, the parking garage. 
some of Omaha's older neighborhoods began to be rejuvenated. Meanwhile, the city's constant movement west continued. Construction technology and architectural styles changed. The labor force changed. Old world crafts prevalent in historic buildings became too time consuming in a fast paced world and too expensive. It's a different city today, a different world. So why look at the buildings and neighborhoods of the past? Perhaps because written histories document the prevailing judgments of their day. Buildings, on the other hand, are artifacts we can interpret. The buildings people constructed to live, work, play, and worship in tell us things that aren't always written in the history books. In these bricks and stones and timbers, we can see how those who came before us struggled with fundamental human questions. Where to live, how to make a living, how to cope with change, what is important in life. One thing we know, the buildings and communities we are creating today will speak to future generations about our beliefs, our values, and how we chose to live. Production of If These Walls Could Speak has been made possible by funds from the Architectural Foundation of Nebraska, the Ada and Leon Millard Foundation, Peter Kiewit Sons Incorporated, First National Bank of Omaha, the Allen and Marcia Bear Family Charitable Trust, and the Robert J. Kutak Foundation, with additional support from the Junior League of Omaha, the Construction Specifications Institute, Lyman Ritchie Corporation, and the Nebraska Humanities Council.